The U.S. bishops have invited us as a Catholic people for the next three years to be drawn deeper into the mystery of the Eucharist. It's referred to as a Eucharistic revival, trying to help us as Catholics embrace and understand the significance of the Mass and the Eucharist in particular. And it is around that theme of Jesus is truly, really, substantially, body and blood, soul and divinity present in the Eucharist. It's a great mystery of our faith, this presence of Christ. I like how St. Augustine in the fourth century wrote about it. We become what we receive. Again, friends, we, we, we don't live in the world and come to the church. We live in the church and go to the world. And so as we just are open to this sense of this teaching of the Eucharist, particularly through this line from John the Baptist, but I'd like to come into it from that line from Pope Francis a number of years ago. He just gently reminds us the goal of our existence is not death, but heaven. And we enter the doors of heaven thanks to the blood of Christ. The significance of the blood of Christ as our entryway into life here and now, but in the eternal. And so at this baptism event in the Gospel of John, there's this very central teaching for us as a Catholic people, particularly at the Mass, because John comes on the scene, and Jesus arrives, and he says what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, for the devout Jew who heard that expression, the Lamb of God, those who were steeped in the biblical story, and remember, the Christian heart sees with the biblical mind. So I just want to do a little teaching around that expression, Lamb of God. Because we say it so often at the Mass. Again, during Advent, we use those words of created, captured, rescued. The rescue operation began with Abram, some 1,800 years before Jesus, when God intervenes and enters into a relationship with this man who's 75 years old and says, Abram, someday your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Abram, I'm going to make you a worldwide blessing through you, and I'll bring you a land. And that promise would be fulfilled. Abraham had to wait 18 years. He was like in his mid-90s when that child Isaac was born. And then shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, Abraham is told to sacrifice the one whom he loves. And that's a whole nother homily. But here they are. Isaac is walking up the hill. He's got, he's like, Dad, here's the wood. There's the altar. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And God says to Abraham, or Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. This rescue operation has something to do with the lamb that God would provide. And then as it unfolds, with Abraham and Isaac and, and Isaac and Rebekah and then Jacob and the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, they keep expanding. Eventually, they, they move to that land of Egypt. And some 400 years later, when they're slaves in Egypt, Moses, the liberator, the rescuer, Moses is sent to deliver. And the night of Passover, that whole instruction, those exquisite details about every household must take a lamb, must slit the throat of the lamb, must wipe the doorposts of the lamb, must eat of the lamb. And if they do, the oldest in the household will be spared. They will be delivered from death. But if they choose not to eat of the lamb, if they don't choose to, they're, they're going to experience death the significance of the blood of the lamb and eating the flesh of the lamb. And so that little reminder from Exodus 12, right? Just remember that, kill, spill, and fill. 
And then that people were eventually delivered to the promised land, but then eventually generations later, then there's this, this sense of the kingdom where they have a king and Saul and David and Solomon, and then eventually the kingdom divides. And then eventually, friends, that biblical story, oh, the people are, the tribes are just attacked by the Babylonians. They're, they're driven away from Jerusalem. And they're in that low point of their life. Like, are, is God going to be faithful? And Isaiah the prophet, some 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah uses this language Okay, let's, huh. Before this, let's come to the Isaiah reading. Maybe we don't have the Isaiah reading. Oh, but Isaiah, you know this. He talks about a lamb, a lamb who's led to the slaughter, who opens not his mouth like a shearer before its shearer. Jesus God would provide the lamb. The lamb would deliver people from slavery to freedom. It was essential that each household kill and spill and eat the fill of the lamb. And that this lamb would open not its mouth. So that's all within that expression, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the, in, the, in the prayer of the Mass, right? Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. That's from the book of Revelation in particular about these eternal feasts, this eternal marriage between the Lamb and the church. And this eternal... So when we, like, when we receive the Lord in the Eucharist, you're like renewing your marriage covenant like a husband and wife. You're just being, like, you're taking in the fullness of the divine body, blood, soul, and divinity. And you're, here I am in my Lord, I come to do your will. That's all within that expression of Lamb of God. Like so often we come to church and we just sing those words, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Let's grow in our awareness. The Christian heart sees with the biblical mind and then the response of the faithful is what? Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Well, that comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And there was this particular moment, this centurion, the one who's not of the house of Israel, he says, Lord, my servant is home at ill, and you just speak the word. I give, I'm a, a commander. I speak a word. My, my orders are followed. You just speak the word. And Jesus, he looks to his followers and says, never before in the house of Israel have I seen such faith. That's the expression. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I love how Teresa of Avila says it. She says, the two pillars of faith, friends, are humility and confidence. And it's not all humility in terms of, oh, Lord, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. I'm, uh, please, please, please. Nor is it all about confidence. God will forgive me. God's mercy is good. She says, it's essential, both of those, humility and confidence. Friends, the Eucharist is a big deal. It's in the Eucharist that we become what we receive. It's in the Eucharist that we come week after week. Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. It's in the Eucharist that we're reminded from the words of St. Augustine. We become what we receive. 